<laughs> uh, you made a. Uh, I'm going to return to another subject for a second. You made a fascinating statement. I said, well, if 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 there's time travel, where are the time travelers? Your answer was, uh, they will not be here until the first time machine is invented because. You could not uh, go back to a time prior to the invention of a machine that would enable travel. Uh, your parallel was you can't travel where there are not roads, and there were, are not roads uh, back that far in time. Um, if time is to virtually end by 2012, Terence, where would you see the invention of time machine, uh, a time machine, the first time machine, uh, b between now and then? Well, I don't think it's between now and then. Actually, oh. the, I think it's then. It's a, then. It's then. In other words, if what the time wave zero thing is showing is that events can be portrayed in this linear way as a line on a graph, yes. that suddenly in 2012, for some mysterious reason, this can no longer be done, it must be because in 2012 time ceases to be linear. And that must mean that because a technology is created which causes time to lose its linear and serial quality. And that could only be time travel. And you believe that at that moment, uh, tens of thousands or millions or who knows of time travelers will suddenly show up? Well, actually, that's my conservative uh, model of what would happen. What's against that is I'm sure you've heard this, the well-known grandfather paradox, which is time travel is always said to be impossible because you travel back in time and you could kill your own grandfather. Uh, paradox, how do we yes. avoid this? Yes. I think we avoid it by actually what happens when the first time machine is invented is uh, the rest of universal history happens instantly. This is the only way paradox can be kept out of the picture. So I call it the God Whistle scenario. So in other words, linearity ends at that instant. And the rest of the history of the universe occurs in a few milliseconds. It's sort of the reverse of the Big Bang, where you get a lot of action in the first few nanoseconds of the universe's life. In this model, the universe undergoes half of its uh, morphogenetic unfolding in the last few milliseconds of its wow. existence. Is that then the moment when the human race, in effect, joins those that we can temporarily now visit only with something like DMT? Or that the human race joins those who have passed over into the great beyond, or both. That's what I think it is. I mean, are, are they one in the same, in your view? Or, or they may be. I thought that you know these DMT creatures. What are they? And the conservative position, since we know there are human beings, is. They must be some kind of human being, but what kind? And the only answer I can come up with is soul. I mean, I resisted this, but is it possible that shamans have been using plants to peer into the great beyond and that there is a kind of ecology of souls out there? When you ask the shaman, they say, well, you weren't listening. We told you we did it with ancestor magic say, oh, I get it, an ancestor. An ancestor is actually a dead person. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely, fa fa absolutely fascinating, Terrence. Listen to me. We're at the top of the hour. Go take a 10 or 12 minute break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about souls because I've, I've got some recent, really incredible news about souls. And you're just the right guy to comment on that. And don't worry, folks, we will get the lines open. Terrence, rest. Okay. All right. Terrence McKenna. Terrence McKenna. Wow. Is my... If, on the other hand, you have the time to sit down and really listen to what's being said, not reacting uh, like a Neanderthal with your, your head hitting the table, then you're going to come away from this uh, thinking some new thoughts. And uh, there is value in that. Back to Terrence shortly. Kenna. That should be an interesting adventure uh, unto itself. But I want to ask you, Terrence, um, about a little bit about souls. You mentioned souls, and uh, and so I have two questions. 
Um, one is, there was a recent, not recent, very old, medical study in which a, a medical doctor actually endeavored to set out and prove in days when it was politically okay to do this kind of thing, that the soul um, could actually be measured that at the very instant of human death, uh, and he, he went through a whole big trip. I put the medical report up on my website. Uh, the human body loses uh, about three quarters of an ounce. Uh, and not due to gases or anything else you might imagine in your mind. No physical cause. All of that accounted for. And he, pr he printed uh, and published this medical study suggesting the human body actually instantly at the instant of death loses three quarters of an ounce of weight. Uh, do you have any reaction to that? Well, uh, looking at it through the eyes of novelty theory, I think nature is very reluctant to give up a, a complex ordered form once it's been achieved. I've noticed that the difference between living organisms and things like chairs and tables, it, the chairs and tables don't metabolize. Uh, in a sense, the, the soul is something which is manifest in time. It's almost as though organisms have a, a hyper dimension. They're, yes. they're objects with time folded inside of them. Yes. And uh, at death, what seems to happen is this complex uh, morphogenetic field, if you will, simply withdraws back into whatever higher dimension it came from in the first place. It's not that...